London Breed. I'm mayor of San Francisco, and I am joined today by the director of the Department of Public Health, Grant Colfax, the director of the Human Services Agency in San Francisco, Trent Rohr, the director of Homelessness and Housing, uh, Abigail Stewart Kahn, the director of the Human Rights Commission, Cheryl Davis. Uh, the police chief, Bill Scott, and the director of the Department of Emergency Management, Mary Ellen Carroll. Uh, today, we'd like to provide an update and, of course, answer questions uh, to the press during this virtual uh, uh, press conference. As of today, we have uh, 1,216 uh, confirmed cases of COVID-19 in San Francisco. And sadly, we have uh, 20 people who passed away as a result of the virus. And as a reminder, datasf.org uh, slash COVID-19 is where you can find details around uh, data to really understand uh, who is actually uh, infected as well as those who have been tested. Uh, I want to be clear that uh, from the very beginning when we heard about uh, what was happening with the coronavirus, uh, specifically in Wuhan, China. Uh, sadly, there was a lot of xenophobia with people who are members of our Asian community. Uh, definitely unwarranted uh, and definitely uh, sad and unnecessary. Uh, but we made it very clear from day one that this is a virus that will not discriminate based on race. And we are seeing that it isn't. And sadly, uh, the xenophobia continues. Uh, but we want our Chinese community and our Asian community in general to know uh, that we are here to continue to provide the resources, the support necessary uh, to deal with what we know continues to be challenges around discrimination. Uh, so it's not tolerated here in San Francisco. Uh, and in fact, as we look at the data, as we look at the inequities as it relates to COVID-19, we are seeing the disparities, the true disparities around income inequality and how as a result of poverty and other things that have sadly been a part of our environments, of our climate uh, for so many years that when there is a pandemic, those issues are heightened, they're, they're basically made worse, they're exacerbated as a result uh, of this pandemic. And specifically, we see that people who may not have access to health care or have poor health conditions or outcomes are the ones most impacted. We see that people who live in crowded conditions and congregate living settings, as we mentioned before from day one, would be very challenging that they are the ones that are most impacted by the virus. The data is what's helping to shape our understanding of this virus as it relates to San Francisco, but it's also playing itself out throughout the country. And I'm really proud of this city because not only do we have an office of racial equity, uh, from the very beginning when we operated this emergency operations center, right here in Moscone Center, from day one, we put into effect an equity team. A team comprised of people who are familiar with various cultures, various communities, for the sole purpose of outreach and providing the necessary support that can help to educate people about the virus, the impacts, and also provide access to services. An example is from the very beginning when we were asking non-essential businesses to close and we had a number of nail salons that were still open where there was a language barrier. Uh, this particular team was a team that outreached to that particular business to not only explain why it was necessary to close, but what other small business services are available. Our public housing sites and the residents of public housing who already are dealing with challenges around not only income inequality, but also access to resources to reach out to the neighborhood nonprofit organizations that work with residents of public housing and affordable housing 
to provide resources and access to food and an understanding about uh, unemployment insurance and all of the resources that are available, it takes a lot of work. And again, I keep going back to the age of social distancing. Typically, you'd walk up, you'd sit down with someone, and you may help them fill out the paperwork or you may help them go online to complete the paperwork. And now, uh, a lot of that work is a lot harder to do, requiring us to be creative, requiring more volunteers for outreach, and making sure that those who aren't necessarily connected to the internet or have no idea of how to use the internet, that we are still supporting and serving them so that no one is left out. Um, we are focused on making sure, and, and Director Davis from the Human Rights Commission will talk more about some of the incredible things that they are doing to help uh, underserved communities throughout San Francisco. Uh, just some of the simple things, providing gift cards to families for food, providing help with completing unemployment insurance applications, uh, providing as assistance and understanding uh, of some of the laws and things that we've implemented in the city and making sure people are connected, informed, and, and supported through basic services. Are, it's really key to supporting all of our residents, and we've been doing this from day one. One, And so she'll talk a little bit about more about that, and I just want to also take this opportunity uh, to really thank the nonprofit organizations uh, and our faith leaders, uh, because they have been the ones on the front lines communicating with their congregations, providing support, providing delivery services informally, uh, and on the ground doing everything they can to support residents. I also want to express my appreciation to so many community members who have taken it upon themselves to knock on doors and reach out to other community members to ask what they might need, uh, especially the people that we know who are in isolation, uh, their neighbors and just making sure, leaving a note at their doors to say, call me if there's anything that I can do. Uh, it definitely makes a difference because the truth is we are really all in this together. What happens to one residence, sa resident sadly uh, impacts another. And so it means that we have to continue uh, those acts of kindness and support for our, our neighbors. Uh, and speaking of neighbors, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, some um, additional things that we are gonna be adding to our data tracker. Uh, people are of course interested in learning about this virus, uh, not only by uh, race or health disparities, but also by location. And so today on the tracker, we'll have information uh, by zip code of where uh, people uh, are, sadly, who are diagnosed with coronavirus, uh, what particular neighborhoods that they live in. And again, it goes back to some of the disparities that we knew um, we're basically coming out as it relates to this disease. We see in the mission uh, more cases, which is consistent with our findings that um, about 25% of those people who are infected in this city are Latino. And the Latino community represents 15% of the population, so there's a huge disparity there. We also see a significant number of people in the Soma area where a large part of our homeless population is located, and there are some real disparities there, especially in congregate living set settings. Um, I want to be clear that uh, this, what this map uh, reveals uh, information that helps us to understand where the cases are, but it's in no way uh, indicates that some parts of our city are safer than others. So I don't want us to get the idea uh, that that is the case in any of our neighborhoods. Uh, this is really about gathering more information and doing everything we can to provide the public with everything that we have, uh, just so that you are aware and so that you understand how important it is to continue to take the precautions that we are asking you to do whether it's wearing a face covering, whether it's uh, socially distancing yourself from anyone who is not a part of your household, uh, and staying inside as much 
as you possibly can except for essential services or to take a walk and get some fresh air, these steps are critical to doing exactly what we need to do to continue to flatten this curve in San Francisco. Um, I also want to talk about uh, many of the challenges that people continue to face. Uh, we early on uh, put a moratorium on evictions for uh, residents and our commercial businesses. Uh, we know that uh, the water and the power will not be turned off as a result of this pandemic, which is, I know, helpful to help ease uh, people's minds just a little bit as we go through uh, this real challenge. But ultimately, we know that the biggest challenge will be access to food, Ac access to food in general, but also healthy food. And we know that communities where we have a lot of low-income families, where people have lost their jobs, where in some cases they may not qualify for unemployment insurance, where our immigrant communities are afraid to maybe interact with the government um, in, in, in various communities. Here in San Francisco, I am so proud of the work that we have done to really identify such a significant need to help provide uh, a diverse population of people with food. And I just want to talk a little bit about some of the things that we are doing. Um, so basically, just recently, we uh, launched a pilot program with the Salvation Army to make and deliver meals to people who are experiencing homelessness and those who are living in encampments. Now, I know people are not necessarily happy with the encampments, but we also realize that those are people who also need food, too. And so the Salvation Army will be uh, partnering with us to make sure that they get fed and that meals are delivered to them, uh, as well as uh, working with us on important programs to provide support to those who are without a home. Thanks to their work, we'll be able to deliver over 1,300 meals daily to 665 people in encampments across 40 locations in San Francisco. Um, this is just one part of our massive undertaking uh, to help get food to our vulnerable populations. Uh, we're also providing three meals a day to the people who are not only in our shelters, but the people who are in hotel rooms who we have moved out of our shelters uh, for the purposes of keeping people separated from one another so that the virus doesn't continue to spread. Uh, I want to also talk about the San Francisco Unified School District and the work that they have done. 319,000 people are, have been fed to date uh, because even though, unfortunately, the schools had to close, uh, there have been a number of people who have showed up, uh, folks who have prepared meals and made sure that kids who would not otherwise have access to meals have access to meals. Almost 12,000 meals have been delivered through Project Open Hand, city supporters, self-help for the elderly, and our isolating and quarantining hotline. So what we announced last week was the ability for anyone who might experience isolation or no access to food to either uh, go to sfgov.org or to call 311 so that we can help to make sure that groceries or meals or what have you is being delivered uh, to families or our elderly um, residents and our disabled residents who may not be able to get out and get food. Uh, I also want to appreciate the food bank. Uh, they've set up 13 pop-up locations in the Bayview Hunters Point and the Excelsior in those communities uh, who are struggling. Uh, again, uh, some of our low-income communities, they've popped up locations. They've had a lot of volunteers. I visited the one in the Bayview Hunters Point uh, where they were handing out food boxes and providing resources, and they're doing that on a regular basis. Uh, Meals on Wheels is another program that continues to deliver food to those who are uh, disabled and elderly. And, and also, I want to just take a moment to appreciate the countless San Franciscans who are shopping for their neighbors, who are reaching out to people that they know that need help. Um, I know one of my 
uh, staff members here in, in, in the city has five uh, seniors that she specifically shops for every single week. Um, and those are the seniors that she's committed to. And I think it's absolutely amazing um, when people take on the responsibility of supporting their neighbors and doing what you can to make sure that they have the resources that they need. Uh, the incredible people of this city who continue to reach out and do all that they can. And so I think it's clear that our goal is to make sure that no one um, is deprived of food uh, during this pandemic. Uh, and I just want to take a moment to appreciate uh, the private sector, the people who have given to give to SF. And I'll talk more about that later on this week. Uh, but we've collected almost $8 million in private money and partnered that with uh, money from the city and county of San Francisco uh, to provide uh, support for uh, people to access food. And it's been absolutely incredible. Thank you to the San Francisco Foundation. Thank you to give to SF. And I'll talk more about that uh, later on this week to acknowledge so many of the contributors that have really gone above and beyond uh, to help around food insecurity throughout our city. I, I gotta say, San Francisco has been a model in providing access to food uh, to people all over this city. So if you know anyone that you think needs help for any reason, please call 311 or go to our website, sfgov.org. Let's make sure that no one goes hungry as a result of this pandemic. Uh, Jeff Tumlin is here from the, the, the SFMTA uh, to talk about some updates uh, with regards to Muni. Um, but I am really um, excited about uh, his announcement today uh, to add certain lines back into the fold, uh, some new adjustments. I want to thank the, the, the transit operators, our Muni drivers, um, the folks who are cleaning the, the buses, the people um, who are just really showing up every single day, putting their lives on the lines in order to get our essential workforce to their destinations. Their destinations include our hospitals, our grocery stores, or places where folks are making themselves available to the public because um, we know that people still need food, they need access to the hospitals, they need their medications and other things, and the people on the front line getting folks without access to transportation any other way are our Muni drivers, and I want to take this moment uh, to really appreciate them so much for their hard work and their dedication, and also for uh, the number of drivers who are coming back to work. Uh, some were out sick, some had concerns about their family members. I want to make it clear uh, that the program we have for first responders includes our Muni drivers and those who are working every single day. So if you're concerned about your families and you want to come to work, which we desperately need you to come to work, and you want to stay here in San Francisco at a hotel room because you are concerned about um, the fact that you interact with thousands of members of the public and you don't want to put your families at risk, uh, we are here for you uh, because we need you and we appreciate all that you continue to do to support the people of this city. Uh, Jeff Tumlin will uh, talk a little bit more about that in detail in terms of an increase in service. Uh, I also want to just uh, remind people uh, because I think um, as far as the face coverings, I want to be clear with people you are not required to wear a, a mask specifically, just anything that can cover your nose and your mouth when you are standing in line or in any location that provides an essential service. If you're out running, you're out riding your bike, you're out walking your dog, um, basically that is not necessarily a requirement to wear a face covering, but doing anything else where you're around other people, number one, it does not take the place of social distancing, but number two, you're required to wear a face covering, and I just want to reiterate that. Uh, please uh, follow our guidelines. Please use common sense so that we can keep you safe and others around you safe as well. And last but not least, uh, today is uh, April 20th, 420. It's a uh, time when in the past uh, there would be a celebration with those who are marijuana enthusiasts. 
uh, at Golden Gate Park, and we made it clear that it is canceled this year. It is canceled today, and I want to express my appreciation to the ambassador of the Bay, uh, E40, uh, a rap artist who's been really a part of the fabric of our rap culture uh, here in, in, in the Bay Area uh, since I was in high school, and so many people love and admired him, and we appreciate his message um, of love and and his expression to ask people to stay at home this year. Uh, and so we hope that you uh, heed our message uh, to stay home today and uh, to not come to Golden Gate Park. Uh, we so far so good. The chief will talk about it a little bit, but we wanna thank you and appreciate you for abiding by our direction on 420. We know it's difficult because you wanna celebrate. We wanna celebrate so many things right now, but unfortunately, it's a matter of life or death, and this is why uh, we are asking people in this city and everywhere to continue uh, to not gather in large groups, to stay at home uh, for the most part, except for essential services, to use face covering, to use common sense, and just to continue to take care of yourselves and your family members so that we can get through this as safely as possible. And with that, I wanna take this opportunity uh, to introduce Dr. Grant Koufax to provide an update from the Department of Public Health. Thank you, Mayor Breed. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Grant Colfax, Director of Health for the City and County of San Francisco. Today, I am glad to bring forward more data on the effect of coronavirus in our community. I have consistently stressed the need to follow data, science, and facts in our collective response. And today is another step forward in that philosophy. The online tracker the online data tracker now includes a map that shows of the, the that shows the approximately 1200 people who have tested positive in, in the city the number of these cases per zip code as well as the rate at each location this map shows us that some areas have higher rates than the rest of the city based on the testing that we have done so far the map affirms what we already know about how this virus spreads. The populations and locations in our city that are most affected by health disparities, by income inequality, and by structural racism are also going to be the areas most affected by this pandemic. Unfortunately, health emergencies exploit the inequalities in society. People with chronic illnesses, underlying health conditions, and from communities who have experienced institutionalized stigma and discrimination are going to be more at risk for getting sick. This map is sobering, but unfortunately, it is not surprising. Unfortunately, it looks like many other maps in San Francisco, including those that depict health disparities, income inequality, and racial and ethnic inequities. And yet this map also supports our focus on equity in vulnerable populations in our collective response to this pandemic. We must make progress in reducing the spread of coronavirus everywhere, everywhere, in our city, or we will not emerge from this pandemic. 
even though our race and ethnicity data are still incomplete because about, of the th about a third of test results we receive do not include this information, I still felt it was important to start sharing the emerging picture now. Let me walk through the map and explain what it does and does not tell us. The map shows confirmed cases of coronavirus in San Francisco by zip code. It is based, and this is very important, it is based on the number of people we have tested. And as you know, we have not tested nearly everyone. As of today, there are about 11,250 tests that had been reported in San Francisco. And about 1,200 are positive. The city-wide rate of the test, of the positive test, of the tests that have been done is 14.07 per 10,000 people. And again, this is important. The map does not show the prevalence or the total number of COVID-19 cases in the zip codes because most people have not been tested. And I want to stress that no zip code or neighborhood is inherently safer than another. Every San Franciscan should continue to exercise precautions. This map should not make anyone feel more relaxed or at the same time more fearful. The number of cases diagnosed in the city, just over 1,200, are small compared to the overall San Francisco population, which is over 800,000. And all San Franciscans have been doing a tremendous job of slowing the spread of the virus. And the map itself does not answer questions about why there are more cases in some areas than others. It is descriptive data based on the zip codes of the people with positive test results. The map shows case counts and simple, and simple rates based on dividing the positive cases of those tested by the total population of, e of each zip code. When we look to explain these data, we think of factors that are, being, that are associated with being diagnosed with COVID-19. The risk factors for getting sick include circumstances such as whether people are living in crowded conditions and whether they have sufficient support to stay at home and reduce their outings. The risk factors for becoming seriously ill or dying after getting sick include reasons such as age and underlying health conditions. The areas of the city with the most cases so far match up with these factors. Let me give two examples. The 94107 zip code currently is one of the highest rates of cases in the city. That makes sense from what we know because the MSC South Shelter is in that zip code, which is the location of the city's largest outbreak with 96 cases among guests to date. The 94110 zip code has among the highest number of cases in the city. This likely reflects crowded housing conditions, including multifamily and multi-generational homes, which make it more difficult to practice social distancing and quarantine and self-isolation. This is the mission, the heart of San Francisco's Latino community Citywide, 25% of positive COVID-19 cases are among Latinos, although they make up only 15% of the San Francisco population. Now, I would like to talk about our ongoing strategies at the health department to focus on equity in our coronavirus response. These maps reinforce our need to continue to do this. We are committed to addressing health disparities in our city, and this 
And this is a major focus of our work in normal times. It is made all the more urgent in today's emergency. During this pandemic, we have from the beginning, beginning known that existing inequities exist, that exist in our system would be amplified. We have been working with community leaders and supporting outreach to community in multiple ways. We remain committed to listening and collaborating in taking action with the most affected communities and community-based organizations. In our response, we have an equity officer, as does the city as a whole, and a community branch that develops strategies to ensure communities that are affected by structural racism and other discrimination are getting the information and services needed. We know that it is critical to have trusted messengers as we engage with communities in order to improve health and well being in the most vulnerable populations. I am, the department is, the city is committed to working with our frontline providers, community based organizations, and neighborhood leaders to address this pandemic. As we are seeing more cases in the Latino community, we have been working with community leaders to ensure that people have the information they need, that they are aware of available resources, and that they receive outreach in their own language. We need to do everything we can to support them. And we have seen people in crowded households who must leave home to work and who have to make several trips a week to buy food or get other essential supplies. They cannot do one big grocery shop due to income restrictions, income limitations, and other potential limitations. People in these circumstances are going to be more at risk. And we are seeing that play out, unfortunately, with a disproportionate number of cases in the Latino community. At Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital, we have seen that more than 80% of the hospitalized coronavirus patients there are Latino, which is a much higher rate than the usual patient population of about 30% Latino representation. We have also learned that some members of the Latino community are reluctant to work with contact tracers and case investigators. This is certainly understandable. It is possible that they are fearful of local government, concerned about immigration, or simply don't have all the information they need to be comfortable. Therefore, we are providing in-language support in Spanish and other languages in the contact tracing program and all public materials about the stay-at-home order, and also with regard to face coverings in other ways that people can protect themselves. In addition, we are being responsive to community needs for more inclusive messaging and materials to create a wide range of Spanish language and Yucatan Mayan community outreach information, including flyers, posters, fact sheets, and social media posts. Community organizations have stayed in close contact through phone and email connection with their Latino clients, and many are doing direct street and community outreach. These are key partners in our collective response, especially given the xenophobia and anti-immigration aspects of how this pandemic is being played out at the national level. After learning that some members of the community are reluctant to work with contact tracers, we held a webinar geared to Spanish language media. We conducted a demonstration in Spanish and emphasized that immigration status has no bearing whatsoever on the work or whether people will receive care here in San Francisco. We are, after all, a sanctuary city. Our environmental health branch, along with, the commu with community organizations, supports essential businesses in the community to, main social, to maintain social distancing as part of their operations. We have opened COVID-19 symptom screening and testing sites in the community 
including at the Castro Mission Health Center and at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital in the heart of the mission. And we are coordinating with a new UCSF research study based in the mission to learn more about the spread of the virus in the Latino community. We will continue to do outreach to inform the Latino community about the coronavirus and the resources available to them. In addition to the Latino community, we are looking closely at all the neighborhoods and community members that may need more access to care, information, and resources. That is why the health department opened the first field care clinic in San Francisco in the Bayview. This clinic will ensure that neighborhood residents have access to coronavirus testing, urgent care, and primary care for the duration of the pandemic, no matter how full the hospitals get. In another community collaboration, the health department works closely with the San Francisco African American Faith-Based Coalition to inform and educate community members through their congregations. We are currently working with them on food distribution so that community members continue to have access to food close to their homes. We have also been supporting the health of the community in Soma and the Tenderloin and Chinatown areas through communications with and prevention education for SROs, including mandated cleaning, multilingual outreach, and other aspects of outreach for these diverse neighborhoods. In the homeless community, we have increased social distancing and food access in shelters and have been moving people to shelters into hotels for their safety. To date, nearly 750 people experiencing homelessness have been placed in hotels by DPH or HSH in collaboration with the Human Services Agency. We have responded aggressively to an outbreak at MSC South conducting contact investigations, mass testing, and moving everyone out, and deep cleaning the building. Teams from the health department and the community continue to provide outreach to people outside, on the streets, providing food, water, and information about hand washing stations, and linking them to support and care. These are just a few examples, and we will continue, we must continue, to listen to community partners, improve our response, and use data to take action and guide our decisions. I am committed to the health and well being of all San Franciscans and doing everything we can to support health and full recovery for all communities in our city during and after this pandemic. Thank you. And Director Cheryl Davis of the Human Rights Commission will now make some remarks with regard to additional support um, within the community. Good afternoon. My name is Cheryl Davis. I serve as the director of the Human Rights Commission here in San Francisco. The Human Rights Commission is tasked with identifying and disrupting racism and discrimination trends in government and private business practices here in San Francisco. I want to thank Mayor Breed and Dr. Colfax for the information they've shared today, this afternoon. Nationally, this virus has woven at an exceptionally cruel path through our most vulnerable populations. We are working to ensure that this health emergency does not further exacerbate the existing public health disparities that our city struggled to, to address long before the coronavirus appeared. 
to also make the connection that these public health disparities are connected to economic and poverty and to homelessness and to geographic areas where people are living in difficult situations. Community knew this was gonna be a challenge long before we had any data. They had been addressing many of these problems long before the pandemic came. As we have seen across the country, communities of color disproportionately have pre-existing health conditions and experience structural racism in ways that are affecting their health and their income, which makes contracting the coronavirus more likely and more lethal. Beyond the physical health, the economic impacts of COVID-19 are yet to be realized. Nationally, people of color and low-income communities are being hardest hit by the coronavirus. Communities of color are more likely to work in essential jobs such as janitors, home health aides, delivery people, grocery and farm workers, all serve industry positions with strong opportunities for exposure. The existing disparities of low income, of the academic achievement gap, of opportunity gaps, contribute to these disparities that we are seeing. We need to shift how our systems partner and collaborate with those most impacted to change outcomes, not just during this crisis, but moving forward. We're excited that we have had the ability to really leverage relationships and work that was already happening in community to, to address this. I also want to recognize and acknowledge that as we work to address food insecurity, as we talk about public safety, as we talk about health and wellness, a lot of people in community that were already struggling were doing this work. And I want to make sure that as we move forward that we recognize that, that as this has been heightened and as awareness has come up, People want to remind us that they already knew this. They were already living with this. They were already experiencing this. And they appreciate that there is now a heightened awareness and attention to them. But let's not forget the work that was being done before this pandemic. We are trusting the resilient communities most at risk of exposure to the coronavirus to guide a community-led response that uplifts what communities need to feel and remain safe, prepared, and healthy. Working with groups like the Latino Task Force or the Samoan Community Development Center or Communities as One, we have found a way to leverage and come together to build partnerships. Prior to the pandemic, Mayor Breed directed the Human Rights Commission to work with community stakeholders and system leaders to explore how our systems contribute to the inequities that we see and to develop strategies to improve outcomes for low-income people and communities of color. Alongside the shelter-in-place order in early March, we launched our community roundtable meetings to bring together diverse stakeholders and address the, these critical issues. Again, people were already doing this work. They were preparing ahead of time to address these challenges. The, robu the robust community-led and equity-centered approach means ensuring essential needs, including providing over 1,500 hot meals each day to 20 housing sites throughout San Francisco in partnership with SF New Deal, uh, Human Service Agency, Department of Aging and Adult Services, and our Hope SF and Housing Authority sites, which are providing an opportunity for local businesses to earn money by providing food for those families that are living in those spaces. We have been working along with the SFPD to distribute face coverings and information about social distancing, working in partnership with many of our community stakeholders, including our street violence intervention program, our faith-based leaders, and individuals like Felicia Jones, who has literally been walking the streets of San Francisco passing out masks. Today, we delivered over 1,000 face coverings in the Tenderloin and the Western Edition. This week, we will work in partnership with SFPD to do some caravans throughout the Fillmore Tenderloin, the Mission, the Western Edition, Excelsior neighborhoods, and the Bayview to, again, distribute face coverings, to share information around social distancing, and working with trusted messengers to share that message. We have been supplying essential household needs directly to community to minimize the the time that they need to spend outside, 
As the mayor mentioned, we've been giving gift cards out to families. We've been working with seniors so that they can understand and go through the process to purchase things online using those gift cards. We've been de developing lip distance learning materials and distributing thousands of books, computers, and activity sheets throughout communities that have been not only hit by coronavirus, but prior to this pandemic and having to shelter in place, we're struggling with the achievement gap and opportunity gaps. We are trying to work with our community partners to ensure that after this is over, that those gaps are not wider. We have been partnering with the San Francisco Unified School District and their equity task force, equity studies task force to develop strategies again that will allow us to not just address what is happening right now, but to be more intentional moving forward. Closing the digital divide by providing critical technology support for students and community through computers, Wi-Fi, and online curriculum. We were able to purchase hundreds of computers in partnership with the Housing Authority and Hope SF, as, long, as well as with Rafiki, uh, Young Community Developers and Collective Impact. We are working to distribute those and give them the opportunity for those young people that weren't able to access them through the school district. We have been supporting trusted community care ambassadors really working to make sure that we recognize the people who have existing relationships, that have the ability to go into communities and ask people to social distance, to see what their needs are and to meet those needs. They have helped distribute thousands of flyers, posters, and communicate culturally competent messaging around social distancing. We have been able to also offer gift cards and protective equipment, personal protective equipment for them as they go out and do that work. We have been launching accessible webinars focused on our African American, Asian Pacific Islander, and Latino communities, and also by focus area, working with our faith-based communities, with our LGBT communities, and working around education, and also doing some work around geography. Organizing a community caravan, as I mentioned earlier, where we are working with the police department, the faith-based groups, and our local community stakeholders to make sure that folks are aware of the new rule around face coverings and to make sure that they have what they need to follow that order. We've been working with black-led and in-language media outlets through ads, radio spots, and developing a communication strategy to email, text, and post on social media targeting our most vulnerable populations. Again, in partnership with communities that already have those relationships. People who already are posting on social media that maybe their friends and their family would be more inclined to work with them or listen to them than they may be to SFPD. I'm really grateful for the work that the police department has been doing to educate and to really find trusted community partners. And we have been able to build and develop those relationships with them. Centering strategic partnerships. We have developed a partnership with PolicyLink to raise awareness about race and COVID-19. We're partnering with schools like Hilltop, the school for pregnant and parenting teens in the 94110 zip code, to be very intentional about the work and thinking about the ways that those students can be helped but also help others. Working with Supervisor Walton and Mayor Breed's office on the implementation of the Family Relief Fund and what it looks like for us to again be very intentional and make sure that we are not leaving out any families. Our Civil Rights Division at the Human Rights Commission is continuing to process complaints of discrimination and manage inquiries that people may have about what their rights are during this time. We were grateful to work with the Emergency Operations Center and to be able to embed an equity officer at the Emergency Operations Center focused on ensuring our disaster response is intersectional and doesn't exacerbate pre-existing stru structural issues. At the Human Rights Commission, we have allocated nearly a million dollars for emergency funding and to address many of the needs that have been identified earlier. We are working with our LGBTQ communities around emergency housing, around food security. We are working with our nonprofits, and again, to thank the nonprofits that have been leading that work, again, to provide housing, food security, to be able to distribute gift cards, and to also think about in this recovery period, many of our youth and our tra tra transitional age youth, 18 to 24, are very concerned about what happens through this process. As we are thinking about employment and economic recovery, a lot of our young people are very concerned. They have been contributing through the years to their family's household income. Last but not least, 
I want to thank the people and organizational partners for their dedication and commitment to serving our community. People have stepped up, as the mayor said, individually and collectively. Organizations have stepped up. They have put themselves at risk. They are distributing food. They are distributing books. They're helping people understand how to access and utilize the internet. Our vibrant neighborhoods and beloved communities are the lifeblood of the city. Where one part, when one part of the city is hurting, we are all hurting. As we move forward towards recovery, our fight will not just be against a virus. Dr. King talked about fighting our finite disappointment with infinite hope. In spite of the data disappointments that we have, we believe that working together, we can actually make a difference. We are looking forward to overcoming this at this point in time, but staying connected and working collectively to address the disparities that have only been heightened during this pandemic. After me, it will be Jeff Tumlin from the director of SM SFMTA who will speak. Thank you. Thank you, Director Davis. My name is Jeffrey Tumlin, and I'm the director of the San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency. As all of you know, on April 8th, we made deep and painful cuts to muni service. Now, thanks to the leadership of Mayor London Breed um, and the support of a half a dozen city departments in the city's emergency operations center, um, along with the support of over 100 disaster service workers in my agency, people whose normal work is being a clerk or a middle manager, who are now supporting us in car cleaning, I'm very pleased to announce that we're, we've begun our efforts to restore Muni service. Starting April 25th, we are going to be bringing back portions, at least, of four Muni lines. And we're bringing those lines back using the same process we use to cut muni service. We've used our abundant data looking at where our riders are. We've also used our data about where essential services are. Most importantly, we've looked very carefully at where are our riders who have the fewest choices in neighborhoods that have suffered the most from historic disinvestment. Um, and finally, we've listened to a lot of feedback from our writers and from various community-based organi organizations about where service was needed the most. So the five lines that we're going to be bringing back include a portion of the five Fulton, running from 6th and Fulton to downtown, serving St. Mary's Hospital, and serving essential services in the Western Edition and in the Tenderloin. We'll be, bring, be, we'll be bringing back a portion of the, uh, of the 12 Folsom, running along Pacific Avenue from Battery Street to Van Ness, um, serving Chinatown, Chinese Hospital, and a corridor full of, uh, of, of seniors who have very limited access to other forms of transportation. We're also bringing back, thanks to a lot of community feedback, a portion of the 28th, 19th Avenue, running from Daly City Bart up, te up 19th Avenue, and making important connections to the N serving UCSF, as well as to the 38 serving three hospitals uh, on Geary uh, Avenue. And finally, we're bringing back uh, most of the 54 Felton, um, our first community service route to come back, which runs all through a long series of neighborhoods, including Hunters Point, Bayview, the Portola District, uh, the Excelsior, Crocker Amazon, and connecting to Balboa Park BART Station. Also this week, we've begun improving service frequency on the 9, the N, and the L, based upon the data that we've got about uh, uh, inadequate space for our passengers and excessive crowding. Uh, this, however, is a reminder that even though we're starting to bring service back, please do not ride Muni unless you are an essential worker, unless you're making an essential trip, and unless you don't have another choice. 
it's very important uh, that if you do have other options than writing Muni, please take them and save a seat and essential space for the essential workers who have no other choice. We know that this is just a beginning of bringing service back, and many parts of San Francisco are still left without nearby Muni service. So I'd like to remind you all that if you are over 65 or disabled, to please sign up for, uh, to please sign up for our essential trip card, which provides deep discounts on taxi service uh, in order for you all to access essential services. As always, uh, you can find the latest and most up-to-date detail at sfmta.com slash COVID. Thank you again for your patience. We're all in this together. Now I'd like to introduce the chief of the San Francisco Police Department, Chief William Scott. Thank you, Chief Scott. Thank you, Director Tomlin, and good afternoon, everyone. First of all, again, I'd like to thank our mayor, Mayor London Breed, and our director of public health, Grant Colfax, for their leadership during this very challenging time. I want to update you on our enforcement efforts of the public health order and give you an update of this weekend's activities. This weekend, we had a very visible presence in our cities, parks, and other public areas to remind people of the public health order. The vast majority of the public, as we've said in many other of these press conferences, have been compliant with the measures meant to stop the spread of COVID-19. With that said, we continue to have, we continue to cite people and businesses who, after being warned, continue to flout the public health order. To date, we've cited 16 such persons, and that breakdown to seven businesses and nine individuals who are violating either the county's public health order and or the state's public health order. We formally admonished 67, uh, between businesses and individuals, we've issued 67 formal admonishments. And when I say formal, that means that an incident report has been taken for those particular admonishments. In addition to that, we've had hundreds of informal warnings, as we mentioned in the past with our officers and cadets and park rangers in our public parks, warning people to abide by the health order and social distance. An update on our crime statistics for the week. During the fifth week of the shelter in place order, which was from April 13th to April 19th, we actually saw an increase in part one violent crimes, which was basically led by 11 additional robberies over the previous week and two additional assaults. Conversely, we saw a 31% decrease in part one property crime, which was 154 fewer property crimes from the prior week. In total, there was a 25% decrease in part one total crimes. That means the serious crimes were 142 crimes fewer than the previous week. This is compared to the week of April 6th through April 12th, which was the fourth week of the shelter in place order. Again, we've had burglaries and vandalisms of businesses and we continue to step up our patrols in that area to make sure that our businesses are protected as much as we can protect them while they are closed. And we have had some arrests in those cases. Again, I'd like to uh, thank our partnership with the district attorney and his office. Uh, they have been able to add looting charges to 19 of these instances of burglaries and we thank them for their partnership there. We encourage everyone to report all crimes, but do so in a way that helps to decrease face-to-face -face contact and inhibit the spread of the COVID-19 virus. With that, we still have our crime reporting unit in place where you can call in these crimes and make them over the phone. You can also report crimes through our website over the internet. Always call 911 to report violent crimes and crimes in progress and we will respond as we always do to the scene.
to make sure that we do everything possible to investigate those crimes and arrest the offenders. Please make sure to make use of the city's new text 911 service if you are unable to make a telephone call to report crime, but you need emergency help. And particularly if it's a domestic violence situation, we really want to emphasize the use of the text 911 feature. Uh, some people aren't able to safely make the phone call, uh, either from their cell phones or home phones or landlines. That text 911 feature will allow you to still contact the police so we can get help to you. For crimes that have already occurred, already happened, that have already happened, that includes nonviolent property crimes or crimes that uh, have already occurred, please call our non-emergency line at 415-553-0123. You can still call 311 or utilize a website, again, to file police reports, and we encourage you to do that to help slow down the spread of the COVID-19 virus. Again, this is a National Crime Victims Week, Victims Rights Week, I'm sorry, National Crime Victims Rights Week. And traditionally, uh, this week is meant to reach out to survivors of particularly violent crimes such as homicides. And there's usually a uh, event in Sacramento to honor the families of these victims of violent crimes. And this year, of course, that will not occur. So we just wanna reach out to those victims and their families to say we are still thinking about you and we are there if you need us. It is a time where we honor the survivors and their loved ones and truly if you need us, we will be there, the city and county of San Francisco, as well as the San Francisco Police Department. Lastly, I want to reiterate uh, the mayor's comments for 420 and the enforcement. So far, so good. Um, and I'd like to really reach out and thank the members of the public who have cooperated with our ask to stay away from uh, the park, Golden Gate Park, where this event is usually held. So far, things are going really, really well. I'd like to thank everyone for that up to this point, but remind everyone to please keep this momentum going. This is literally a matter of life or death, and I don't think I'm being melodramatic when I say that. Your choice to attend or not to attend these type of gatherings could be the difference in your life or somebody that you love. So we ask to continue the cooperation so we can continue to flatten the curve and slow down the spread of this virus, but so far things are going really well and we hope to see that continue throughout the evening. With that, I'd like to thank you all and I think we open it up for questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you to our speakers today and for those joining us virtually, the first set of questions are for Dr. Grant Colfax. Thank you, Dr. Colfax. The first question is from Molly Solomon, KQED, and David Horowitz, SF Examiner. Supervisor Matt Haney plans to introduce a resolution urging the Department of Public Health and the Department of Homelessness and Supportive Housing to provide free testing to all clients and staff in the homeless response system. Is universal testing possible for the city's homeless community and staff? If not, why? So, um, as I've talked about um, previously, uh, we need to ensure that the populations who are prioritized for testing are the people who need it uh, most. And that includes people who are symptomatic um, with COVID-19, people who have had uh, high risk exposures and healthcare workers and first responders. Um, and I wanna say, especially in those first two groups, there are a number of people experiencing homelessness who fit into, into those, to those groups. We are, we are also following the data, science, and facts in terms of how to prioritize testing when there is a positive case discovered. 
And you will see um, in our approach from the MSC South Shelter to the um, case in the, in the Division Circle Navigation Centers, uh, following the information and with the experts in the um, investigation teams, uh, we take different approaches depending on the circumstances. Um, in MSC South, um, it became clear that there was a um, widespread outbreak, and that is why we tested everybody in that shelter, um, and we provided them with the care and support services that they required and needed and closed that shelter. Um, another approach was taken at the Division uh, Navigation Center um, where there was a case detected and there was contact investigation done and uh, testing was done there um, on a more limited scale because at, this, at that time we didn't find an increased number of, of cases as a result of that in investigation. As our testing capacity expands and as we are able to obtain uh, more of the swabs and the gunk on the media for transporting uh, the the, the uh, testing materials, we will be expanding our, our testing uh, uh, capacity and, and testing more people. Um, and I expect, um, uh, based on state guidelines that were released this morning, uh, those priorities will include uh, testing people who have had uh, close contacts with COVID-19 cases, um, uh, but to, who meet the definition of having a close contact, uh, but do not exhibit uh, uh, symptoms. Um, so that would be another place where we would be expanding our, our, our testing, um, including, of course, with, with people experiencing homelessness. Um, the other places that we are currently in discussions with, and I think if, if it, it makes sense, um, is exploring um, where and when it would be appropriate to uh, test uh, people coming into the hospital, uh, patients coming into the hospital, and, and, and what, what that would take. Um, I think in some cases it's, it's much um, easier to do that when you have one of these rapid tests um, that, that take uh, 45 minutes, um, but um, we obviously don't have nearly as many of those as, as the tests that take one to two days, and obviously we can't wait for one to two days uh, for somebody um, who's to, to admit somebody to the hospital. So my point is, um, we, as we inc expand our testing uh, capacity, we need to continue to follow uh, the, the science and data about um, who needs the testing most, focus on the vulnerable populations, so that as we expand our testing and contact investigation, we are saving uh, the most lives possible and focusing on those that are most vulnerable to dying from this disease, whether the, the people be housed or whether they are experiencing homelessness. Thank you, and from David Hor Horowitz again, as a follow-up, have staff and residents at shelters and navigation centers already been tested? So yes, as, as, it's, as I've said, we, we do this on a uh, basis on what we have learned about the specific situations where there is a, a detected case. In the um, case of MSC South, uh, all the, all the uh, residents and, and, and the staff were tested in those situations. And uh, we will continue to test um, as, as guided by our disease investigations um, at shelters, at navigation centers, and elsewhere in the city. Next question is from Trisha Thadani, SF Chronicle. More than 60 people have tested positive for COVID-19 at the Central Gardens Assisted Living Facility. When did DPH learn of this outbreak and what support, if any, is the department giving to this facility? So um, the latest numbers I, I have from that, that facility is that a total of 67 cases have, have, have been detected in that facility. And uh, if I can do my math right, 39 uh, I believe it's 39 residents and 28 staff. So it is a very uh, serious outbreak. Um, the state um, is, is, has oversight of these, of these facilities and they are the lead agency in this. But um, when we became aware, when we were notified of the, of the initial cases on March 30th, um, we immediately started collaborating with the facility and uh, with the state in terms of ensuring that uh, uh, as much was being done as possible to protect uh, both the residents and the staff. And I would say that um, one of the key things that we're, work that we're ensuring is that the lessons learned uh, with the CDC investigation, the two-week CDC investigation at Laguna Honda, um, it, are being applied and, 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 and being translated to be able to help uh, with this facility as well. So I'm very concerned. I've said from the beginning, um, many have said from the beginning that, that nursing homes and other such congregate living for, for older adult situations are a major 
uh, 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 area where, uh, unfortunately, uh, people people will suffer from this disease, and we're doing everything we can um, to to mitigate the spread of the virus, both in this specific facility and in facilities across the city. Thank you. The next question is from Janie Har, the Associated Press. How many homeless people to date have been tested posi have tested positive for the virus? So as um, we have described in the MSC South, um, we have a total of uh, 96 uh, 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 positive cases there. We've had several additional uh, cases um, in, in other uh, shelters and navigation centers across the city. Um, I do not have a total number of, of, uh, for to share with you at this time, and that is really because uh, much of the testing that's being done across the city, there is no requirement to um, uh, record housing status, and our data team is working hard to uh, provide uh, uh, better estimates um, based on hospital numbers and based on our own DPH data systems to try to cross-match uh, the data with regard to the positivity that's that's on the testing form with uh, hospital admission data in the hospitals that are under DPH's jurisdiction. And I hope to be able to share that data soon. Follow-up, are you confident you know the rate of infection among the homeless population, and are there any plans to expand testing to the homeless as is being done in LA County? So I think one of the, as, as, as I mentioned in the, with regard to the data tracker and the map that I showed, it's very important that uh, we see that the rates that we are uh, presenting are basically the rate, are not basically, they are the rates um, that, are, that are based on the positive test results of, of all of the people who have been tested in the city. Um, so no, we do not know um, the true rate, if you will, of, of, of the coronavirus in uh, populations in, in the city. We don't know that um, for the state. We don't know it regionally. Um, we don't know it nationally. Um, but what, what, we, what we are doing is ensuring that we are testing uh, people, again, who are at mo uh, most uh, risk for the disease based on their symptoms, their close contacts. Um, and we, as I said, we will be expanding uh, testing criteria as our supply chain, as, as the materials that we need to do the testing, as, as it becomes clearer um, that we will be getting more of those as um, our response uh, is able to, to have uh, more reliable sources of, of those materials. We will be expanding that testing, including close contacts uh, of people um, with COVID-19 uh, uh, for, for people who do not show those symptoms. Currently, you have to have symptoms um, uh, consistent with COVID-19 and be a close contact um, in, that in, in, in terms of being tested. So we will be expanding uh, our, our uh, testing criteria, including for people experiencing homelessness. Thank you. The next question is from Loy Almiron with Mission Local. Is there a possibility that California like New York, will begin to produce its own supply of testing swabs. Um, I, I would, I, it's a possibility. I don't have any additional information to speculate on that at this time. The next question is from Joshua Sabatini, SF Examiner. What is the next type of data set you plan to release to the public on Data SF and when? Well, we have a, a quite a bit of data on, on, on the data tracker um, at this time, um, and uh, we are continually updating that information. And I don't have a, a specific timeline to share with you about uh, what would next be released, uh, but I do want to ensure you that um, when the data are the relevant data that um, are, are accurate and, uh, and, and help inform the public that it's my commitment uh, at the health department to ensure that we are sharing uh, accurate data as quickly and as transparently as possible um, with the public to help them better understand the, the d dynamics of the pandemic in San Francisco. As a follow-up, will the department release zip code data for deaths? Um, well, I think one of the key things that, that um, there are two things that I think to, to emphasize right now about uh, the, the response in San Francisco. One is if you go to the data tracker and you see the numbers of hospitalizations, both in general and in the ICU, um, those numbers have been um, fairly flat over the last two weeks, which again is really a testament to the response of all San Franciscans in terms of uh, taking this um, pandemic very seriously. So when we we keep talking about flattening the curve. And for now, um, that, curve, that, that curve is very flat. And remember, we're looking at those hospitalizations because those are the people who are sickest. 
And those are the people that um, need our help the most. And right now, our system is able to, 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 to manage, um, at has enough capacity to manage those, those most seriously ill people. Um, so the curve has, looks flat. That could change at, at, at any time. But for right now, I think it's important to realize that, that we have the capacity. With regard to the second piece of, of information, to, to, and, and going back to the question, we have had, unfortunately, 20 deaths. Um, and, and obviously, um, you know, that, that's concerning to me. And, um, and my condolences go out to, to the family members and friends and community of, 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 of the people who have died. Um, and um, th that, that number is, is still relatively um, small to, compared to other jurisdictions. Um, I expect those numbers to increase, and as those numbers do increase, we will um, share data as appropriate on our, on our data tracker. Thank you. The last question is from Dan Kerman with Cron4. Dolores Park was apparently crowded this Sunday. Are you concerned all of, our, all of our efforts will go to waste as the weather improves and more people visit parks? I think it's, I, I, I think it's an important for people to continue to ensure the social distancing guidelines are, are followed, um, that people take the proper precautions in terms of washing, washing your hands, other infection uh, precautions that we've talked about. Um, if you do go to work as an essential worker, that you do not go to work if you're sick, that we um, adhere to the facial covering uh, guidelines and orders that were issued on Friday, um, and that we do not become complacent, that we do not become complacent. The fact that uh, the curve that I just talked about is relatively flat is, again, uh, because of the work, um, the hard work that all San Franciscans are doing in terms of complying uh, with, with this order. And I think it's important that we reinforce um, and, and recommit ourselves to this because um, as the weather gets better and as people, I mean, I, I will say it, it, this is hard to do. It, it's stressful, it becomes, it's tiring, um, but it's even harder to deal um, with situations um, that we've seen elsewhere. And we really need to continue to commit ourselves uh, to taking the social distancing and other pu public health measures necessary. Um, until we start seeing um, signs that those um, that the shelter in place orders could be relaxed in a uh, scientific data driven way um, as we as we move forward into potentially another stage of the of this epidemic. Thank you. That concludes today's press conference.